Fort Smith. It's the window through which you see the vast panorama of the history of the West unfolding. This military outpost acted as a funnel feeding into the wilderness, soldiers, traders, explorers, emigrating Indians, and settlers. They came here first before heading out to their Western destinations. And for nearly 80 years, Fort Smith's presence served notice to the lawless that the full and complete authority of the United States government stood on the frontier. Fort Smith's story begins on Christmas Day, 1817, when a keel boat heavy with troops and supplies landed at Bell Point on the Arkansas River. Major William Bradford and 64 men of the United States Rifle Regiment, under orders from General Thomas A. Smith, began constructing a small wooden stockade. This was the first Fort Smith. Escalating conflicts along the western frontier made this military post necessary. The growing violence, however, wasn't between whites and Indians, but between the Cherokee and the Osage. For more than 200 years, Europeans had been moving inland from the Atlantic and Gulf coasts. This white expansion displaced many Indians who fled their native lands in the southeast to preserve their way of life in unfamiliar territories. The clash between the Cherokee and Osage began this way. Beginning in the 1780s, groups of Cherokees left their homelands in the southeastern part of the United States and moved into what is known today as Arkansas. They immediately came face to face with the Osage, who resisted the Cherokee invasion of their hunting grounds. In 1808, the federal government tried to win the peace by negotiating the cession of all Osage lands in Arkansas. This allowed President Thomas Jefferson to encourage more Cherokees to move into the area and settle permanently. As the number of Cherokees increased on what was once Osage land, outbreaks of violence became more frequent, and the two tribes were on the verge of open warfare. U.S. officials hoped the establishment of Fort Smith would ease tensions and make the area safe for future white and Indian settlement. After several years of struggle, the military began to see results. In 1822, the Cherokee and Osage agreed to a peace treaty. Soldiers could then concentrate on building roads, patrolling frontier boundaries, and regulating trade and travel through Indian country. Their success prompted a local newspaper editor to declare Fort Smith essential to the Western defenses of the nation. Enemies, he said, would find the post a little Gibraltar on the Arkansas. By 1824, however, the situation had changed. Military commanders realized that in order to maintain control of the frontier, they needed to relocate the fort farther west. Troops abandoned Fort Smith and moved 80 miles up the Arkansas River, where they built Fort Gibson. The soldiers, however, left behind a civilian settlement, which eventually grew into a bustling trading center. Although no soldiers were permanently stationed here for the 14 years between 1824 and 1838, the government viewed Fort Smith as an important part of its emerging policy of Indian removal. For years, the federal government had promoted a policy of transforming the Indians into its image of a civilized people. However, the desire of land-hungry Americans often interfered with this process. It was hoped the relocation of the Indians to the West would give them a chance to complete their conversion into Christians and farmers. At the same time that officials were considering removal, some Indians were successfully adapting to prevailing American lifestyles. Tribes like the Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Muscogee, and Seminole in the southeast farmed, built mills and plantations, and sent their children to missionary schools where they learned to read and write. Some of the Indians even owned black slaves. It's understandable then that they had no desire to give up their lands. To safeguard their rights, the Cherokee even adopted their own constitution in 1827, declaring an independent nation with complete authority over its own territory. Individual states, however, did not want self-governing Indian nations within their boundaries. The Cherokee were forced to fight several legal battles with Georgia when that state tried to extend its laws over them. Although the Supreme Court eventually confirmed the sovereignty of Indian tribes, President Andrew Jackson would have none of it. 
He refused to enforce the Supreme Court's decision. And he ignored scores of treaties with various Indian nations, which stipulated that the U.S. government was to protect Indian lands from being overrun by white settlers. Jackson's administration was also responsible for the Indian Removal Act of 1830. It gave government officials the right to negotiate treaties with Indian tribes, exchanging their eastern territory for land west of the Mississippi. These treaties were often signed by an unauthorized minority of the tribe because they supported removal. But the majority of Indians were reluctant to leave their homelands. However, they soon had little choice. By the mid-1830s, the army was involved in removing some Indians from their lands, even though this violated recent treaties. After being forced to abandon their homes, many members of these southeastern tribes were placed in stockades and then marched more than 900 miles to the west. They suffered from a lack of clothing and food and from diseases like cholera and smallpox. This forced migration is now known as the Trail of Tears. Fort Smith served as the primary supply depot for those Indians who managed to make it to Indian territory. Between 1830 and 1834, soldiers dispensed blankets, axes, blacksmith tools, spinning wheels, and other goods that they had been promised by treaty. These goods were to help the Indians rebuild their shattered lives. When the distribution center moved farther west, Fort Smith's buildings fell into disrepair. <laughs> In 1838, the War Department ordered the construction of a new Fort Smith. It was a decision based largely on the Arkansas Congressional Delegation's argument that violent feuding within the Cherokee Nation would spill over into the white settlements. Military leaders like future U.S. President Colonel Zachary Taylor thought this unlikely and objected to the expense of the second fort. Despite this opposition, building began on the new garrison slightly east of the original stockade. The second, Fort Smith, held quarters and barracks for approximately four companies of men and was enclosed by a stone wall 12 feet high and three feet thick. Over the next 30 years, Fort Smith was essential to military operations in the Southwest. Goods from its commissary and quartermaster storehouses supplied military outposts throughout Indian Territory. By the white wing. Forts Washita, Wayne, Gibson, Towson, Arbuckle, and Cobb all received a steady supply of troops, equipment, and orders from Fort Smith. As a result, all the military roads, stage routes, mail service, and telegraph lines extending across the frontier radiated from Fort Smith, which also acted as the distribution point for food, farming supplies, and federal funds for those Indians migrating west. The Civil War brought an abrupt halt to these activities. In April of 1861, Confederate sympathizers known as the Arkansas Volunteers seized control of Fort Smith. The post location and its reserves of food, clothing, and ammunition made it a plump prize worth fighting for. But within two years, Union forces reoccupied the fort and held it until the end of the Civil War. When the hostilities came to an end, troops at Fort Smith were used in a variety of ways. They supervised the disarming of Confederate forces in the area, they protected the border country from bands of guerrillas, and they assisted in post-war reconstruction by organizing the Fort Smith Council of 1865. This council arranged for new treaties which had to be negotiated with those Indian nations badly divided by the Civil War. Like white America, each tribe splintered during the conflict, with some members supporting the North and others the South. Military use of Fort Smith slowly declined in the post-war years. By 1871, accidental fires had destroyed both officers' quarters, and the War Department decided against rebuilding. After 54 years of intermittent occupation, the Army permanently closed Fort Smith. But the site was not abandoned for long. In November of 1872, the Federal District Court of Western Arkansas, which was responsible for maintaining the peace in Indian Territory, moved into Fort Smith's former soldiers' barracks. In the aftermath of the Civil War, tribal governments were overwhelmed by the task of rebuilding their communities. Intertribal feuding and an influx of fugitives and outlaws who were not subject to tribal law made it impossible for the Indian nations to restore order. <laughs> 
The federal government also seemed powerless to remove these intruders. And soon, lawless men and women of every creed and color were moving into the 70,000 square miles of Indian territory, where they roamed free, robbing and killing at will. The violence and lawlessness of the frontier gave rise to the saying, there is no Sunday west of St. Louis, no God west of Fort Smith. The graft and corruption that plagued the federal court system in Fort Smith only contributed to the problem. It wasn't until President Ulysses S. Grant named Isaac C. Parker to the bench that some degree of order began to appear. Parker was appointed judge of the Western District of Arkansas in 1875 and for the next 21 years dispensed efficient and effective justice. The government's most urgent priority was to stop the lawlessness in Indian Territory, and to do this, it hired 200 deputy marshals to track down the criminals and bring them to trial in Fort Smith. The deputy corps was made up of every racial group on the frontier, and men like Bass Reeves, Heck Thomas, Zeke Proctor, and Sam Sixkiller were among its most prominent members. These lawmen led hazardous lives. They not only had to track down dangerous fugitives in a lawless wilderness, they had to bring them back alive. A deputy who killed a suspect who was resisting arrest had no hope of collecting his fee, and he even had to pay the dead man's burial expense to boot. It was a job that required enormous skill and even more luck. Many didn't make it. During Parker's tenure on the bench, over 100 deputies lost their lives in the line of duty. But with the help of citizens' posses and Indian light horse police, the deputies began making arrests. Suspects were brought back to Fort Smith to face a court appearance before Judge Parker. A person found guilty of rape or murder faced certain death. That was the law. And Judge Parker sentenced killers like Cherokee Bill and rapists like the Rufus Buck Gang to the gallows. Those who committed lesser offenses like horse thief Bell Starr received less severe punishment. Parker never once attended an execution in Fort Smith. In fact, he wrote, I'm in favor of abolishing the death penalty, provided there is a certainty of punishment, whatever the punishment may be. It's not the severity of the punishment, but the certainty of it that checks crime. The grisly duty of carrying out death sentences was left to professional executioners like George Maladin. Judge Parker earned his reputation on the bench, but his influence extended far beyond the courtroom. He supported education reform and women's suffrage, and he worked to improve the living conditions of prisoners in his jail. Dank, dirty, and reeking with odor, the crowded basement prison was dubbed hell on the border by its inmates. Congress finally agreed to spend the funds necessary to build a new jail wing. It was completed in 1888, and a year later, construction of a new courthouse began on 6th Street. Judge Parker's court moved into the new facility in 1890. Beginning in 1889, the lands of the Indian Territory were gradually open to settlement. By 1896, a growing population of permanent U.S. citizens required Congress to create three new federal courts to oversee the region. This significantly reduced the area of jurisdiction of the Federal Court of the Western District of Arkansas. Judge Isaac Parker died a short time later. His doctor said he worked himself to death. Fort Smith's leading role as the seat of law and order in the Southwest ended with the new courts and the death of Judge Isaac Parker. For 80 years, Fort Smith struggled to bring peace to this region. From the earliest military attempts to end the war between the Cherokee and Osage, to Judge Parker's strict enforcement of the law, this post tells the story of the military installations, legal institutions, and specific individuals who truly defined the West. <laughs>